I'm Art Turlip and welcome to ECE 20002. Today we're going to cover field effect transistor devices, in particular metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, i.e. MOSFETs. Uh, I asked you guys to review uh, chapter 13 from your EE Fundamentals 1 textbook, which I also posted on Brightspace uh, so that you can read it at your leisure. If you haven't done that yet, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and do so because we're going to go pretty quickly over the basics of how these things are constructed. So, to review, we have uh, in the N type, or the N uh, MOS, we have N type terminals here and here, surrounded by uh, an area that is P type. And our goal here is to apply some voltage to the gate. I'll do this in red. Apply some voltage to the gate so that we can create a channel between these two. Now in depletion mode, all we're looking at is we have this extra region already and we're trying to just maintain that. So you'll see when we get to the equations that the threshold is much, much lower for the depletion mode stuff. Um, it's basically just changing uh, the orientation of the, of the threshold so that you are simply maintaining an open uh, passage between the D and S terminals. Okay, so as uh, in this end channel example, as we look down here, uh, as we get above the threshold, you can see that this red channel here opens up, okay, and it's allowing current to flow. And we're going to go up linearly, or this is our linear triode region, as we continue to increase our uh, voltage between uh, D and S. And that's going to continue to occur until we finally get to a point where this, let's try a different color here so we can contrast it, until this starts to pull away from that uh, drain terminal. And you can start to see it sort of cup, cup away over there on the right. And then finally right here, we start to see it completely uh, pull away. And that's where VD is equal to Vsat. So that's when we get to the saturation region. And then from there, it continues to pull away until, well, we're basically stuck at a fixed current no matter how much voltage we have between S and D. Okay. With the uh, PMOSs, all we're doing is switching uh, N for P's, and we're going to switch the orientation on our signs for pretty much everything. And then in depletion mode, again, all we're doing is we're changing the requirement for our threshold, um, and we'll, we'll show that in the equations. So a couple of takeaways from this. As we're building, so right here. So when VG gets greater than VT, we finally are able to produce some current. And that you should be familiar with. So as soon as I get enough voltage at that gate, I'm allowed to pass some current between D and S. And once I continue to increase that G value, or I'm sorry, the VG value, I'm going to pick one of these, I'm going to be on one of these lines, okay? And the, the higher the voltage, the steeper this linear region is going to be. And then as I increase my VD, that's going to start to do this pull away. So we're going to start to get this knee in whatever curve I happen to be on. So I've selected a curve or a line with VGS, and then I move forward along that line with VDS. 
And I keep moving forward on that line until I hit the final knee of the curve where this plateaus, okay? Until, dot, 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 until I get to what we call saturation. All right. Once I'm at saturation, I'm stuck there. It doesn't matter how much more I increase VDS, I can't get it above that current for whatever that curve is. But if I was on, if I was on a different one of these lines here, right? If I was on say this line versus this line, then that maximum ID or your ID sat, if you wanted to think about it that way, would be determined based on that gate voltage. So it's kind of a couple different things working in tandem together to put you somewhere on, on one of these curves. So the curve that you're on is determined by your, uh, your gate voltage and the position on the curve is determined by your drain source voltage. So let's go ahead and write that down on our on our notes for today. So kind of two big takeaways. Okay, so the curve you're on is determined by VGS and the position on said curve is determined by VDS. And what the heck, we'll add one more thing. And uh, we plateau after, oops, missing a letter there, after VDS gets above D. <laughs> there we go. Uh, VDS. After our VDS gets above saturation. So we're stuck. I.e. we can't exceed a certain ID in a given configuration. Okay. We could, we could adjust it based on our other inputs and our resistors and our VGS. But by and large, you know, once you get to a certain point with that VDS voltage, if that's what you're able to adjust, and then you're going to hit a, a, a maximum. Okay. I don't want to linger too much on the physics of how these work. Because in theory, you guys have already covered that. And more importantly, I want you to be able to utilize... Uh, these in a, in a circuit design. So let's go ahead and take care of some notation stuff real quick and then we'll dive right into some examples because I think doing the examples is gonna be the best way to learn how to utilize these. And you can always come back and review the, uh, the physics later. Okay, so we have VGS here. For us, is always going to be G minus S, okay? So GS is G minus S. In some places, some data sheets won't have them well ordered. They may use VSG where they where we mean VGS. Okay, you're just gonna have to figure it out from context a little bit. Uh, same thing goes for uh, threshold, right? There's there's other notation out there. VT is sometimes used as thermal voltage, so be aware of that when you're looking at data sheets. Um, so we're just going to use VTH to be absolutely clear that we're talking about that threshold voltage. Um, and then uh, saturation, pinch off, we're going to use those interchangeably. But we may write VDSS as the saturation for VDS, that, that voltage potential between D and S, saturated. Um, and then, of course, uh, quiescent. Right? The quiescent operation is its behavior in a steady state. So this is how you pronounce it. Uh, just 
so you're aware. Because it's kind of a weird word. All right. Moving on. I want to go over these charts a little bit. And I think the best way to do this is, is with a sort of diagram. So we have two main regions of operation, right? It's either on or it's off. And if it's off, we say it's in cutoff mode, right? Or cutoff region. And this switch here is determined by the relationship between VGS and the threshold voltage of the device. So the threshold voltage is determined by the MOSFET itself, okay? And our VGS is what we're applying to it, what we're changing or what we're able to do about it. Okay, so when we get a, for the end channel, it's pretty, pretty easy and that's why I like using this as an example. But as soon as we get above the threshold voltage, which is gonna be positive, so you can see here, for the end channel enhancement mode, our threshold's gonna be positive, and we just need to get above that, right? So if we're below it, as we are here, then we're in the cutoff region. But as soon as we get above, we can, we can go uh, into either of these other two regions. So then, once we're on, we have two other regions, right? We can access the triode, or what we call the linear region, And we can also access the saturation region. So effectively in the, in the linear triode region, this device is acting like it's got a resistor in there. And then after it gets saturated, it's just stuck at a particular current. Can't go any higher. Uh, just a couple more notes on the construction of the MOSFET, just so you have something to write down uh, that's not in the book. We have the end channel is our donor, and our P channel is our acceptor, and these are both ions. Uh, and the extra doping between the wells is what we call the depletion mode. And no channels between wells is our enhancement mode. So in enhancement mode, we must create a channel for the current to flow. And in depletion mode, right, must make channel. And in depletion mode, we merely need to preserve said channel. It's already there for us. Hey, the current can flow without application of voltage to the gate. So VGS equals zero still allows for an ID that's greater than zero, which is pretty neat. So we don't, we all, if you're thinking about it in terms of a water spigot, it's like the water spigot's already partly on for you and you'd actually have to uh, apply something or change something to that MOSFET in order to close that spigot. So just to be clear, between these two regions, we're looking at VDS versus VDS sat. And in these two super regions, we're looking at VGS versus VTH, or the threshold. And then again, for P-channel, everything's just getting reversed. So you can see all these signs in here are just opposite of what they are above. And for depletion mode, the only difference here is that the orientation of the threshold voltage where we expect it to be just changes so you can see here that if we expect the threshold voltage to be greater than zero making it less than zero 
means that it's going to be on if we apply just zero for our condition down here. So if VGS was equal to zero, then we're going to definitely be outside the cutoff region, all right? Because for the depletion mode, VTH is already less than zero. So VGS equal to zero is going to be greater than that. So a real quick aside is that when we think about VDS sat, what we're really looking at is the difference in voltage between GS and oops, and TH. So again, we can write this as follows. VD minus VS is equal to VG minus VS minus VTH. And we can do a little bit of algebra here. Just keep walking the dog. All right, VD is equal to VG minus VTH. We move the VG over to the other side, rearrange our terms, and we end up with VGD is equal to VTH. So this voltage represents the situation where the drain potential has achieved the boundary condition for the existence of a channel at the gate drain junction. And VGD is equal to the threshold voltage, as we've shown here. The biggest takeaway from this is when we're at saturation, we can write VDS sat as VGS minus VTH. All right, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, the current equations for our, uh, for our MOSFETs, in this example here, we have uh, N is representing our uh, N-type MOSFET, but you can replace this with a P, and what do you know, you have the P-type MOSFET. Um, so pretty easy to work with these equations in here. And all KN is doing is representing a physical condition in the MOSFET. So you may have the KN or KP value given to you. You may not have that. You may have the, the width and the length and the uh, capacitance of that oxidizing layer uh, and some other you know coefficient attached to that. Generally, it's easier to, to have this form. So um, we're going to, for all the problems we're doing today, I think we just have the KN value associated with the MOSFET, so that makes life a lot easier. But know that it comes from somewhere. Know that it comes from the physical uh, conditions associated with it. And the, the width and length here, by the way, are based off of that channel that we're creating. General procedure for solving uh, these, these type of MOSFET problems, these early ones with, uh, with this type of configuration are as follows. We assume that we're in the saturation mode, or the saturation region, excuse me, and uh, we recall that IG, big I, big G, is equal to zero. So that is, there's no current flowing through that gate, which comes in pretty handy. And then for this kind of problem, in particular, we're going to assess using KVL, um, and then uh, next, lecture we're going to do some other more complicated um, assumptions for for the MOSFET and then we're going to solve for VGS and use this to, to find our ID and then once we do that we're going to kind of solve for VDS to make sure that that saturation assumption was valid so we're a little bit getting ahead of ourselves in terms of making assumptions that may not be correct, but in, at the end of the day, this is the easiest way to approach the problem. Let's take a look at the first example that we have in the book. Now I'm gonna relabel these 
uh, in future versions of the book because this is technically the first example, but example one in the text is actually uh, associated with a later problem in this chapter, so don't get confused there. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to tackle here is the diagram on the left. And what we're going to do is use KVL to solve for VG. All right, now you may recall, I'm going to write it down here so it's kind of out of the way, that we have VN like so, and we have some kind of... Uh, Let's see here, and Z2. Ah. And this goes to ground. V out. Okay, we have some kind of impedance that might be present here, and we're splitting it up. This is what's called a voltage divider or voltage division. And in our situation, because this guy is not equal to zero, we're going to have to do a little bit extra work and we're going to rewrite this as, we'll call it V end. <laughs> it's like the end, but you know, something different. Anyway, our equation is going to be slightly different. So we're going to do, this difference between the two, because we're not comparing it to ground, we're comparing it to what's at the very last terminal down there. And I'm sure there's a better way to, to notate this, but I'm just going to use my, my mathematical licensing here and, and go kind of nuts. We don't need to use this for very long. We know that V out in this situation is our VG, right? And we have V end is just minus five volts. And we have all of our Zs here are just resistances. So it should be two uh, mega ohms over, I'm going to leave the units off of this because they're all the same, but we have 2 over 2 plus 3, okay? And then we have V in, which is 5, uh, and the difference between that and the end, which is minus 5, comes out to be 10. And then we're going to move this guy over to the other side, make life easy. So, in the end, we end up with VG is equal to uh, 2 over 2 plus 3, which is 5, uh, times 10. Uh, so we get some cancellation, so that's 4, and then minus 5 again, so minus 1 volt. Oops, minus 1 volt at the end of the day, okay? I'll put a little box around that. Whoop. All right, now that we have VG... So we need to make a closed loop in this system. And our closed loop here is going to come from the difference between, you can almost imagine probing this here and here, VG and this loop here. So we have VG is equal to VGS plus 2 kilo ohms times ID, right? This is representing the voltage drop that occurs across uh, that two kilo ohm resistor, plus that minus five at the final terminal. So we simplify this, and we end up with minus one V is equal to VGS plus two kilo ohms ID I guess we just pop that five over to the other side. So we end up with four volts. Okay, now we're going to exploit the fact that we're making the assumption here. So assume that we are in the saturation region. And what is that bias? Well, we have this equation here. And we have 
VGS still kind of floating around. We have ID also floating around. Now we know that if we assume saturation, that we end up with a, a nice little equation for everything. And we're gonna pop in this equation right here uh, for our ID, okay? Just doing a simple substitution. So this is equal to VGS plus two kilo ohms, and now times all this stuff. So one half, one half KN times VDS squared. And this is using the saturation, all right? Okay, now let's use some of the information that we were given. And we're gonna use the fact that VDS is equal to VGS minus V VTH, sorry, there we go, VTH, in order to solve this a little bit. Um, when we simplify this, it becomes 4V equal to VGS plus 2 over, we'll call it volts. I'm going to just ignore the units for right now because they end up being volts in the end. Um, so it just kind of gets cluttered with all those V's floating around, I think. So 4 is equal to VGS plus 2 times VGS squared minus 2 VGS plus 1 squared, but it's just 1. Now, the reason we have this here is VTH, and I should have probably written this well, that's fine. VTH here is going to be positive, right? And in the, the PMOS examples and in the um, NMOS depletion mode, you're going to have a VTH that's less than zero, right? So if you see something like the following, if you see something like For our case, VTH equals 1, but in NMOS, or, or sorry, but in PMOS, that would imply that VTH is actually equal to minus 1, or in depletion uh, NMOS case. Okay, so all I'm trying to get at here is that sometimes and in the homework and examples you're going to see this just make sure that you're grabbing the right vth make sure you're grabbing the correct orientation and in order to do that you can always go back to this handy chart and see where that should be so you can always go back and look at this and say aha i know what mode i'm in i know what channel type i have this is where my vth should live so if you're given an absolute value of that device, you know exactly how to use it when doing calculations. Okay, enough on that. Continuing on, we just need to solve the algebra here. So we do a little bit of work. We end up with 0 is equal to 2VGS squared minus 3VGS minus 2. Uh, for those of you that it's it's been a little while, uh, you can use the your quadratic formula, and you're going to end up with uh, the following: VGS is equal to minus one half or two. All right. Now, of the two options, we need to take the value that exceeds VTH, right? Because we said. Now, let me write this in red. We said we're saturated, right? So if we're saturated, then that implies VGS 
must be greater than VTH. Which means that VGS has to be, of the two options, the one which is greater than 1 volt. Ergo, VGS is equal to, to 2. Okay. Now we can confirm our answer by checking KVL down the right-hand side of the circuit. So we're going to run one more of these. I'm going to add another page in here. Give us some space. But we're going to run this down the right-hand side. And we're going to start from the top here and do our little loop. So we end up with the following. Uh, 5 volts is equal to ID times the 1 kilo ohm plus VDS plus ID times 2 kilo ohms plus minus 5 volts. And just to confirm, you can see here that we have the following. Oops, I'll make this a little bit thicker. We have the following that we're going down. And we have one, two, three, four. We can call it five different pieces if you if you want. But we have one, two, three, four, and that and then five. The difference there from top to bottom. You can combine those together. Uh, it's just going to be 10 volts, right, if you move that to the other side. So um, your completed loop uh, is going to uh, jump between 5 and negative 5. Okay, anyway. Here we go. Go ahead and you know combine like terms, isolate stuff. We're trying to isolate our uh, VDS to confirm that, again, it's right here, we use KVL down the right side to, to confirm saturation. And what we're going to do is use the same ID we just derived. Solve for VDS and confirm that VDS is greater than or equal to VDS sat which is, as we mentioned, VDSS. Okay, so now we combine like terms, solve algebraically. We end up with 10 is equal to 1, and I'm going to write milliamp just so we keep track of that, times uh, 1 kilo ohm plus VDS plus 1 milliamp 2 kilo ohms. Our millis and kilos cancel, so we can forego the units for the time being. We just have 1 volt plus VDS plus 2 volts. Simplifying this gives us 7 volts is equal to our VDS. And now VDS exceeds, right? Let's go ahead and uh, VDS sat. You remember that VDS sat is equal to VGS minus VTH which was equal to 2 volts for our VGS. Remember, we solved for that. Minus VTH is equal to 1, which was given to us. So all we have to do, our VDS sat just has to be, uh, I'm sorry, our VDS just has to be greater than 1. That's it. And 7 is greater than 1. So therefore, this is the three little dots here, by the way, if you haven't seen those, it's just therefore. VDS is greater than VDS sat. Um, and there we go, that's it. So, I'm gonna put a nice little little box around this too, if we were solving for it. It's equal, oops, not one volt, 
seven volts. Okay. Okay, so those are the things that we're looking for here. And VGS also was important. So these are kind of the big things I'm looking for here in these kind of problems. Solve for VGS, you know, confirm or deny the assumption that you made, state exactly what mode or uh, what region we're operating in, etc. Okay, now we're going to do this problem again, but we're going to use the diagram on the right hand side and show you what happens when our resistor values don't quite give us that saturation region. So let's do that really quick. Let's add another page. Okay, I'm gonna pick up here. Okay, so what's changed between our two situations here? We still have three and two down the left and right hand side. Uh, we still have five volts at the top, minus five volts at the bottom. We still have that two kilo ohm resistor here and here. The only thing we've changed between these two problems is our resistor just before our MOSFET. So we've gone from one kiloohm to eight kiloohms. So the only part of what we've solved so far that's going to change is when we take KVL down the right hand side, as we did here. So what we're gonna read what we're gonna do is rewrite this equation utilizing the eight kiloohms instead of the one kiloohm and resolve for VDS. So let's go ahead and actually, I'm gonna cheat. Whee! Oh, I hope this works. This would be fantastic. Copy. Paste. Haha. <laughs> fantastic. All right. Uh, yes. All right, so now, all we gotta do is rewrite this. This actually goes to eight kiloohms. All right, perfect. So everything else stays the same. We have five is equal to, and we know that the kilos and the millis are gonna cancel. So we got eight plus VDS. You can already see some issues here, right? Cause we're, we're upping this side by eight, which means this has to go down <laughs> by eight. So, uh oh, all right. Let's see how we do. Plus one times two, so that's two minus five. Again, following the same uh, pattern that we had from before, we just end up with uh, 10 minus eight minus two is equal to VDS. You can see the problem here. VDS, rut row, is equal to zero. So this uh, let me write it with red. Contradiction, right? If you haven't seen this, it's just two arrows crossed. It means contradiction. Uh, VDS is less than VDS sat. All right. Therefore, we must assume that the device is actually in linear triode region or triode linear region. Uh, device... Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention that the other name for this is ohmic region, right? And it's called the ohmic region, or ohmic, not Olmec, <laughs> but ohmic. Um, the ohmic region is is called that because and I, I kind of like it because it's got this resistance to it that makes it go up linearly with respect to the voltage that you're applying. So it kind of follows Ohm's law, right? The voltage that you put in determines the current that you get out with a linear coefficient attached to it, just like you have with the resistor. So it, ohmic, I think, actually <laughs> makes the most sense here, but um, but we call it uh, triodor linear. Uh, anyways, because we are in the 
linear or triode region, we have to use the other equation for VGS all over again and see what we get. In particular, right here when we were solving for VGS, we assumed that we were in that saturation region, right? So we need to go back and fix that assumption. So if we recall the equation that we had, it's kind of complicated. So, so we're gonna take this equation now instead. And what we're trying to do is adjust our value VGS accordingly. All right, so once again, we're solving for this. And in this instance, we're going to use this equation for ID. So we have four is equal to VGS plus two kilo ohms times Kn VGS minus VTH VDS minus one half VDS squared. Now note here, since we're not in the saturation region, VDS, um, we don't have that nifty cancellation that we that we had before. So we're gonna have to do a little bit more leg work. Okay, now we're left with a single equation with two variables. We have GS and we also have DS that we need to resolve. So this is where uh, if the assumption breaks down, the equation can get quite complicated. Uh, I probably won't delve into this on, on an exam necessarily, but you guys should be pretty familiar with it because uh, it may have relevance in other questions that we do in the future. And it's, it's a good thing to know how to, how to resolve. And then we're going to explore after this an easier way to sort of think about and approach this sort of problem. All right, so we're gonna find another equation as follows. Similar to how we did it before, we're gonna look down the right-hand side here of our circuit. And we're gonna use uh, KVL to come up with a nice expression. And that expression is just gonna be VDS, our potential between our DNS right here, is equal to 10 volts minus 10 kiloohms times ID. So the current running through here, right, times 10 kiloohms, and we're getting that because these two guys are in uh, in series with each other. So we can just add those together. And if we're looking at it from the other side here, um, what we're effectively doing is, is considering this gap as our uh, thing that we're trying to acquire based on the rest of that loop in the KVL. Okay, so now that we have this other equation, we can go ahead and use this equation here with this equation here, and we rewrite to uh, solve for VDS in terms of VGS. And what that's gonna do for us is allow us to plug in uh, VDS, which as it turns out, if you do some algebra, minus two volts, um, it's going to allow us to plug this in without having to rewrite the entire expression over and over again with ID. Because ID is rather cumbersome, right? So we'll just kind of sidestep that a little bit. All right, so now what we're going to do is plug this guy in everywhere we see VDS into this expression. So we have four equals VGS plus four, and I'm kind of foregoing the units at this point, VGS minus one times five VGS minus two. And again, you can see the substitution here for uh, DS. And then minus one half, um, oops, I forgot a parenthesis here. Sorry about that. 
five VGS minus two quantity squared. That's this guy squared. And then all of that is being multiplied by four. Okay, so we can now solve this big nasty quadratic because that's what this is, right? We have a we have a square term right here, and we're gonna end up with a VGS squared and a, a VGS term and a constant term. What you get is actually rather messy to have to solve, so I'm gonna leave that as a <laughs> as an exercise. Um, Some things happen, and what we end up with is VGS is equal to 2.11 volts, or VGS, oops, GS is equal to 2.59 volts. And right away you might be thinking, oh hey, I'll just take the uh, greater of the two. Um, you know, both of these seem valid at first, but actually only one of them will when plugged into uh, our original equation, produce a VDS in the linear triode region. So if we plug in the larger value, we have the following. If we try that, we get VDS sat by definition is equal to VGS minus VTH which is, and again, we're just picking the larger of the two in this instance. Let me go ahead and, and uh, let's do a little bit of color coding here. So let's take this guy for this one, okay? And that's gonna give us um, 1.586 volts. Now, if this here, is our saturation value, our VDSS, then we can go ahead and use that same VGS to derive the associated VDS. So VDS in this case is equal to five times 2.59 minus two. And this roughly comes out to about 2.9 volts. Herein lies the contradiction. Because now we have VDS, which is this guy, is greater than our calculated saturation value. So we're back to uh, saturation, which we know isn't true because we already showed that that wasn't the case in this, in this circuit. So this value of VGS can't be correct. So we try the other one. And this one should work. Uh, we confirm it. VDS sat is equal to uh, two point, let me do some color coding. Let's do, let's do some pink. Actually, that's a little close to orange. Let's do some green. So we have this guy here. And now we're using that for our VGS minus VTH, which is just one still. And that gives us a value of 1.11, uh, eh, four volts, give or take. Okay. And now we calculate VDS not the saturated, just the VDS, again, five times, and in this case, it's 2.11 minus two. Well, that's much smaller. This is just 0.11 times five, right? So that's equal to 0.5685. And you probably could have seen right away, oh, that's close to 0.1. So this is gonna be about 0.5-ish, a little bit over. Um, so right away, you would have been able to say, oh yeah, this is definitely going to fall below one, and this is just above one, so, haha, -ha. Eureka, we got it. It works. Uh, so therefore, VGS 
in this situation is actually uh, 2.11 volts, right? This is going to be kind of our final answer here. Uh, and, and VDS is equal to 0.5685 volts. Okay, that's a lot of work for all that. Um, so yeah, not what you generally want to have to do. Uh, since we're running kind of low on time, I want to encourage you guys to take a look at example one in the book because I wanted to go over one other quick thing that is really important for understanding this kind of material. And that's load lines. So you remember each one of these guys here, oops, let me get a thicker one. Each one of these guys here represents a particular uh, VGS, right? So we can call this VGS4, right? This is VGS3, VGS2, and VGS1, okay? And for these various values of VGS as it's increasing, and this is for an N-type, right? It, it'd be different. It'd be going more negative for the, for the P-type. But as this increases, we end up with steeper and steeper curves associated with our uh, I, uh, excuse me, ID and v, v, DS. And what we can do is actually take our inputs to calculate our ID max, and our VDS max. And this load line, as we call it, will give us a fixed, sorry, uh, it's a graphical way to represent the, the possibility space of a fixed set of parameters for the circuit uh, configuration, which is exactly what I wrote right here. In short, this is an easier way to try to deal with um, changes in the resistor values and in the input-output voltages. So keep that in mind when you're trying to solve these problems. I think one of the homework problems actually utilizes a load line, if not, um, I may try to add one before the course starts and, and hopefully we can pop one in there. Okay, I want to do one more quick example or at least try to set it up so that you guys have um, a little bit more experience with these. Let's explore depletion mode a little bit. So in this instance, our uh, we have an end channel D mode or depletion mode MOSFET. And we're going to use the same kind of technique. Uh, we're given these inputs and we're trying to find those, those Q points so that ID and VDS, etc. Okay, using voltage division, we can come up with six volts on the left hand side. We don't need to actually uh, calculate it out again this time. Just notice that uh, 14 plus six is equal to 20. So you can see how things are going to cancel out nicely with voltage division. And in this circumstance, we actually are going to a ground, so we don't have to do any funny business uh, with, our, uh, with our voltage division equation. So it should be very straightforward for you guys. Okay, so we have 6 volts is equal to VGS, just like we did before, plus ID times 2 kiloohms. And from here... We just go ahead and substitute in the ID equation for saturation. So once again, we have VGS plus 2 kiloohms times 1 half 2 milliamps over volts squared, etc., etc. V, sorry, VGS plus 4 squared. Okay, now why is this plus 4? Notice here that VDS sat is actually equal to VGS minus VTH. So why do I have a plus here? <laughs> well, it's pretty simple. Uh, VTH is actually minus 4 volts. Recall, VTH is less than 0 for N channel. D mode. 
So if we're given this absolute value, like I warned you guys before, uh, you're going to take the negative version of that. So note that well. All right. Now all we do is a little bit of algebra. And we end up with the following. VGS, assuming saturation, right? Assume saturation first. VGS is uh, going to be equal to minus 2 or minus 6.5. Um, as it turns out, minus 6.5 isn't going to work, right? Because that's actually below, this is below VTH. So that's not going to work for us. So VGS must be equal to minus 2. Now notice here the VGS is, is actually negative, but VTH is more negative. So it's still greater than VTH. So our uh, MOSFET is letting current flow. Now, let's see if that current flow is in saturation region or if it's in the linear region. So the next thing is we solve for ID. So we have 1 half times 2 times minus 2 plus 4 squared. This is equal to 4 milliamps. Now, where do we get all this from? This is from that equation, right, that we uh, have from before. We're going to assume saturation, right? So this is that equation right there. And we, we have uh, VDS sat as that difference. So that's con uh, it's pretty convenient. Okay, now we're going to try to solve for VDS and see what we can get uh, that might be in saturation mode, and then we'll confirm our, we can confirm our answer. Um, okay, so VDS is defined as follows. We have 20 volts, right, is equal to ID times 2 kilo ohms. That's going through that first resistor, plus VDS, the uh, voltage potential between D and S plus that same current running through the next 2 kilo ohm resistor moving down we can do purple here see oops let's make it nice and thick all right and uh, oops That should do it. We go ahead and work this out a little bit. This is equal to VDS plus 16. So we end up with VDS is equal to positive 4 volts. Now we need to check our uh, assumption here. Does V... I always do that. Does VDS... Or is... English is hard. <laughs> is VDS greater than VDS sat? Well, we know VDS is plus 4 volts. VDS sat, in this case, is just minus 2, which is our VGS, minus minus 4, which is our threshold voltage. So this is equal to 2 volts, positive 2 volts. So 4 volts greater than 2 volts? Yes. All right. So we can go ahead and kind of highlight some features that we have here. VGS. I'm going to use a color. Let's use a color. VGS, VDS, identified the region, you're in good shape. Okay, so in the homework, there's a great problem here that uses a PMOS example. Um, all, the, all of these process the exact same way, guys. So it's really not too bad. 
And I encourage you to do all the homeworks, of course, but uh, this one in particular might be a good launching off point to just kind of confirm that you know what's going on. You can even use uh, this PowerPoint sheet if, if you wanted to um, and just print it off and do it or just do it from the homework. But basically, there's really not too much difference going on here. Just be careful with how you use the equations and you'll be in good shape. Okay. That's all for now. Thank you guys for your attention, and we'll see you next time.